the air tonight with breaking news. Officials saying Taylor Swift shows in Vienna this week will be canceled because of a thwarted terror plot. Out of concern for people's safety, they say. What we know tonight about how police stopped the suspects, allegedly planning to target the massive crowd supporting one of the world's biggest stars. Lots of new developments on that front. We'll have them in a second. Plus, here at home, millions of people bracing for Debbie to make landfall again, maybe as an even stronger storm, with first responders rescuing stranded people already. More dangerous flooding on the way. We're live with our team in the storm's path. Then the battleground blitz for the new Democratic ticket on the road and on the tarmac, but then again, so is J.D. Vance. Why the GOP VP pick walked up to Vice President Harris's plane today and a reality check on some of this presidential campaign's newest attacks. And the startling reveal from NASA and Boeing on those astronauts who say they aren't really stuck in space. Turns out they may be not stuck for another six full months. What's next now and how a 10-day trip turned into half a year in what sounds like a bad outer space reboot of Gilligan's Island later in the show. Plus, also later in the show, the new allegations in a new lawsuit after that Titan sub implosion with the family of one of the men killed. One of the biggest Titanic wreck experts ever wants to see now. That's coming up. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we are starting with that news out of Vienna, where officials say they are canceling multiple Taylor Swift shows, part of her Eras tour, out of safety concerns. This is after police there say they uncovered what they describe as an ISIS-linked terror plot, arresting two men connected to this and potentially narrowly avoiding a horrific nightmare. I want to show you here. This is what Swift's website looks like right now here. Under each of the concert dates, it says that all tickets will be automatically refunded within the next 10 days. The shows were supposed to start tomorrow night and go into the weekend. It's important to note here, this attack was not directly targeting Swift herself, but apparently, according to officials, it did hone in on her concerts. Federal and state police in Austria say it was part of a plan to attack major events across Vienna. They say the men they arrested were apparently radicalized through the Internet. Tom Winter is all over this developing story for us tonight. So bring us up to speed, Tom. What do we know and where does this go? Sure, Hallie. So right now, authorities in Austria, according to two U.S. officials briefed on the investigation, say that they are looking for one or perhaps multiple individuals who may have had some knowledge of this attack. And so that's new. And as we heard from those Austrian police officials earlier today, uh, this is an active and ongoing investigation. To let people know uh, what, how all this came about, uh, the Austrians put these individuals under some form of surveillance. They were on top of what they were plotting. And one of the individuals, the 19-year-old who was arrested in Lower Austria, was in the process of purchasing chemicals and had purchased some chemicals that could have been used to develop a bomb. Uh, at some point, they were running kind of close to this weekend's events. And just to be clear here, it wasn't as if they were looking at this weekend in Vienna and said, well, we want to conduct an attack. What's playing? What's happening in Vienna? No, they were very specifically focused, we are told, on the Taylor Swift concert and these large events there. Obviously, you're talking about 65,000 people that would have been attending this concert, another 15 to 20,000 that would have been in uh, downtown Vienna proper. And so this obviously had significant concerns. And I think one of the things that they would have been worried about, just based on prior investigations, OK, if the way they were going to conduct this attack uh, was not going to be available to them, would they have conducted an attack another way? And I think that was going to be the concern here, based on uh, officials that we've spoken to about how this investigation went down and they said, you know what's the safest thing to do? Put handcuffs on these people and get them behind bars. Okay, but help us understand this because over the course of the last couple of hours here, as this has unfolded and as we've learned more of these details, it sounded like initially officials in Austria said they were not planning to cancel the concert. Obviously, now we're seeing this update on the website. If you go and click through the links, you see a statement from the organizer saying, you know, these shows have been canceled out of basically an abundance of caution, out of safety concerns here, Tom. Why the flip? Right. So I think, one, officials are typically loath to say to an event, you must cancel unless they think, yeah. look, there's just no way you're going to be able to put this on without somebody getting injured or worse. Uh, number two, I think they felt that they had a pretty good plan in place. Austria has a team called the COBRA team, which is kind of analogous to the H FBI's HRT or hostage rescue team or the NYPD's ESUA team. These are people with heavy weapons that are trained uh, to really uh, uh, face a threat like the type 
type of threat that they could have been facing here. I think ultimately, though, if you're an event organizer, you have to look at the liability, you have to look at the concern, and I'm sure there were people, because some of our own colleagues who were planning on attending this show reached out to me that had some concerns and perhaps some second thoughts. So I think that that all uh, goes into the calculus here. I think this event probably could have gone off. And there is a school of thought, Hallie, here, that when you cancel these events uh, and, and people do understand the concerns of the organizers and the performer and all those that would have wanted to attend, uh, that you might be playing into the hands of a mm. potential terrorist here, that's always something to consider. So where does this go next, Tom? And do we have a sense of timeline for how this investigation plays out? You mentioned they are still looking for anybody uh, who might be linked to or have any knowledge of this alleged plot. Right. I think there's a lot that's going on here behind the scenes. And I think okay. to take a quick step back here, Hallie, uh, there have been a number of potential plots on the Olympics itself that were foiled prior to this. Uh, there have been another a number of other incidents in Europe, all with some ties or connective tissue to ISIS. And so I think people have to be uh, concerned that there remains this threat. And it's something the FBI has talked about on the record from the director himself out of his own mouth. So uh, there is definitely a concern of a heightened terrorism environment, that uh, environment was increasing prior to Hamas's attack on October 7th and has only gotten worse from there. So this is something that law enforcement is acutely aware of. And I think when this chapter is finally written or this book on this particular attack is written, it's going to show an awful lot of coordination among law enforcement agencies around the globe and some work here that uh, perhaps stopped something that could have been quite serious. Tom Winter, uh, thank you so much for all of your reporting on this. I'm going to let you get back to working the phones and working your sources for more on that as it develops. Appreciate it. Let's bring you back here to home right now, where, as we speak, hundreds of thousands of people down south are bracing for Tropical Storm Debbie to strengthen again just hours from now and slam the East Coast for the second time, possibly triggering more of the kind of dangerous flooding you're looking at here. Trees down along streets, on houses, roads just inundated. Look at those folks on the bottom forced to evacuate. Chairs and tables littering the parking lot at this Arby's in South Carolina. Our weather team telling us as this storm creeps up the coast, intense flash flooding, a huge storm surge, even tornadoes are possible. Even hundreds of miles north of where I'm sitting right now in Washington, maybe all the way up to Boston. The storm system, the outer bands of it at least, are already hitting New York and New Jersey, where you can see some people being rescued after flooding from just monster rainstorms. I want to get to our team on this now. Meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us, but I want to start with Maggie Vespa in South Carolina. And for them, Maggie, it's like, here we go again. I know. Yeah, Hallie, exactly. I mean, this has kind of been like a weird lull day, although you can see the rain hasn't stopped. It's been coming down sort of sporadically throughout the day. But what they've been doing to prepare while they sort of have this break and this chance to catch their breath is I want to show you, you can see behind me, see those two kind of pipes that are sort of like leaning off the edge here? They have been pumping flood water from the city's storm water collection system basically back into Charleston Harbor. And the reason we have this background noise is they're being manned or run by two massive generators over here. They have these pumps these generators stationed along the harbor, like at least three or four that we can see. They told us they have 10 throughout the city, basically trying to get rid of all the flood water they can while they wait for this kind of round two. And we can show the video again of just how bad this has been over the last couple of days. Uh, Debbie made landfall as a tropical one hurricane in Florida. Bill will run through this, but then it became, uh, excuse me, a hurricane, a category one hurricane in Florida, became a tropical storm, making its way up through Georgia into the Carolinas. We had flooding here in neighborhoods yesterday, and basically, the people that we talked to said that this is really freaking them out, especially those who just moved to this area. We talked to one woman who got here just a couple of days ago. This is her first experience with a hurricane. Take a look. You moved here two days ago? Yes, just in time for Debbie. <laughs> got here Saturday night around 9 p.m. And then the warning started coming around 10. I'm really concerned about the losing electricity, mm -hmm. I think. And then also, if you do start getting water in the house, you know, what can you do at this point? Yeah, exactly. What can you do? I mean, people here are really bracing. They're relying on kind of infrastructure and tactics like this. Obviously, she brought up losing power. Uh, power outages have been a huge issue, Hallie. We had hundreds of thousands without power across multiple states initially. That's been coming back on. But again, everybody right now almost bracing for like Debbie's Act 2 up and down the East Coast. Maggie Vespa live for us there in South Carolina. Maggie, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Stay dry, stay safe. Bill Karens, where is this thing heading next? And importantly, how strong is it really going to be?
Yeah, intermission or halftime is just about yeah. over, and now we're getting ready for that act two. And as it moves inland, it's going to be another flood event. We're not too concerned with the winds. It's at 60 miles per hour. The Hurricane Center says it may get a little bit stronger up to like 65, but that's not going to be the real issue. I don't expect even a lot of power outages. It's a flood story over the next 48 hours until we get rid of this storm. And you can see during the day today, the rain has really increased here in interior sections of South Carolina and southern portions of North Carolina. So here's the new update from the Hurricane Center. They have that new landfall. Fall, that second landfall right around 2 a.m. right near about Georgetown in between Georgetown and Charleston and then by tomorrow afternoon it'll be crossing from South Carolina into North Carolina so this slow motion is going to keep those heavy rain bands in a line from about Florence to Fayetteville and that's going to be the area of greatest concern for flooding tonight and then we take the storm over areas of central Virginia back up to Pennsylvania through area upstate New York into northern portions of Vermont and that's going to bring a risk of flooding in mountainous areas as we go throughout Thursday and Friday. Flood watchers are up now from State College all the way to Savannah. We do have a couple flash flood warnings that have just been issued in South Carolina as the rain bands are picking up. Additional rainfall on top of the six or so inches of rain, six to seven inches here in South Carolina and North Carolina. I'm very concerned with the mountains of Virginia and then a wide two to four inches as we go through Pennsylvania and also upstate New York. So, Hallie, uh, we're just beginning the next stages. I, 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 tomorrow at this time, I guarantee we're going to have some flash flood emergencies out there. I'm very concerned with the Blue Ridge in Virginia. Mountains and tropical systems are a bad combination. All right. Well, you'll be keeping an eye on it, Bill. Thank you very much. We'll be talking, I'm sure, again tomorrow. Appreciate it. So tonight, the rubber is meeting the road for the newly minted Democratic ticket on the road as we speak now in Detroit, where Kamala Harris and Tim Walls are set to take the stage together, we think, in the next 90 minutes or so. We'll show that to you live once they get set up in a little bit. And the focus today for them is on key Rust Belt battlegrounds, not just Michigan, where they are tonight, but Wisconsin, where they just were, and where J.D. Vance just was as well. At one point, at the same airport, walking up to Air Force Two and saying he wanted to check out his future plane. So with the race set, the tickets in place, the question of who Harris's running mate will be out of the way, there are some other big questions now emerging. Like if and when Walls and Vance, the two new VP picks, already going after each other on the debate trail, on the uh, campaign trail, when might they face off on a debate stage? There's this question of whether Walls' small town Midwestern background can bring over more voters to the Democratic side. The Harris campaign saying they're seeing some energy behind him. They've raised $36 million, they say, in the 36 hours or so, 24 hours after Walls was named. And how will Democrats and Republicans try to define Walls, who polling shows is relatively unknown to lots of Americans right now? Democrats see him as relatable. Republicans are going after his background and his record. Neither side has a lot of time in this supercharged sprint as we are officially 90 days from Election Day. We've got team coverage tonight. Garrett Hake with the latest from the Trump camp in Michigan. Courtney Kuby is with us for a reality check on some of the attacks you've been seeing. But I want to start with Gabe Gutierrez, who's live for us in Detroit. A big multi-state blitz for them. This is very kind of uh, right out of the, the, the campaign playbook here. Drop your VP, go on a big tour, hit a whole bunch of states that are going to be really important for this campaign. Yeah, that's exactly right, Hallie. And look, I can barely hear you, and that's the way the Harris campaign likes it. It's a loud yeah. environment here. I see a lot of enthusiasm. Very different, Hallie, from previous rallies that we had seen under Joe Biden. He, had, he was here just a couple of weeks ago. Feels like an eternity ago, right? Well, this is very different. This is a larger crowd than we have seen under the Joe Biden, uh, under Joe Biden on top of the ticket. And it, it really goes to show you what the Harris campaign is trying to do. They're trying to shore up union support support here in Michigan. Governor Walls, of course, brings that union support with him. They really want to uh, juice here in this key battleground state. But, Hallie, I got to tell you, earlier today I was in Dearborn, and a lot has been made about Arab American voters here in Michigan. Some of them are still skeptical, even though Kamala Harris is on top of the ticket right now. Let's take a listen to what a few of them told me. Do you think Harris can win Michigan? Um, I think if she still makes some real policy changes, then it's possible for her. I think it's a step in the right direction, and that, that pleases me very much. At this point, do you plan to vote for Kamala Harris? Not unless I hear a permanent, unconditional ceasefire. And that is what we hear. 
and that's what we hear over and over again from some of those Arab American voters. But the crowd here, they are very excited. Many of them telling me that they are thrilled to have Governor Walls on the ticket, and they expect to hear from those candidates in just a little bit higher. What's interesting, Gabe, is we're looking at polling that shows a virtual dead heat in Wisconsin where these candidates were. I know you're in Michigan now. Uh, is the way that we heard some of the crowd chanting earlier today, thank you, Joe, right? A reference, presumably, to the president, of course, who has withdrawn from the ticket and is now giving his very first interview since deciding to drop out of the race. I know you haven't seen it yet. I am not going to ask you to talk about it because it has literally just hit our inboxes. But President Biden, in a new interview with CBS, was asked if he is confident that there will be a peaceful transfer of power on inauguration in January 2025. And President Biden says that if Donald Trump wins, and I'm quoting here, then no, I'm not confident at all. He says, I mean, if Trump loses, he says, I'm not confident at all. He means what he says. Uh, he means it, he goes on to say. We're going to turn around that soundbite as soon as we can, Gabe. But this is part and parcel of the argument that President Biden had been trying to make against former President Trump before he dropped out of the race, which is, as he and other Democrats see it, that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, Hallie. That is an argument that President Biden had been making quite a bit. But if you notice in these last, uh, you know, well, in yesterday's rally, and we'll see uh, with tonight's rally as well, we haven't heard that phrase, threat to democracy, from Kamala Harris and from uh, Governor Walls just yet. They make the argument in, in different ways, but they haven't really hit that threat to democracy argument that we heard over and over again from President Biden. They're focusing on, on other things, re reproductive rights. Also, um, you know, some of the background uh, that uh, Governor Walls has, being a veteran, being in the National Guard for more than two decades, they are really stressing right now to try and introduce him to America, uh, because as you know, almost three-fourths of the country, according to a recent poll, either don't know who he is or have no opinion of him now. Gabe uh, Gutierrez, thank you very much. Live first there in Detroit. We'll check back in with you as that rally gets a little bit closer. Garrett, let me bring you into the conversation here. Donald Trump is not unfamiliar with that attack that he is, as Democrats see it, a threat to democracy. What's been interesting is the way that the uh, uh, Trump Vance ticket has been trying to counter the now Harris Walls attacks, and that is largely without Donald Trump, at least until this morning. It is J.D. Vance who's been out on the campaign trail. It is J.D. Vance who has been where you are, who has been out there being sort of the more vocal and public face on camera on some of this, playing sort of that traditional role of being a tack dog, just as Tim Walls is doing as well. Let me play a little bit of the back and forth today. J.D. studied at Yale, <laughs> had his career funded by Silicon Valley billionaires, and then wrote a bestseller trashing that community. Come on! What bothers me about Tim Waltz is the stolen valor garbage. Do not pretend to be something that you're not. I'd be ashamed if I was him and I lied about my military service like he did. Okay, a strong accusation from Vance there that we're going to break down with Courtney Kuby in just a second. But, Garrett, it has been a feisty day on the trail, to say the least. Yeah, I think that's right, Hallie. And look, the Trump campaign is basically throwing every available tool at their disposal at Walls today. They're trying to figure out how best to define him. It started yesterday with a fundraising email that suggested he would be open the gates of hell, sort of apocalyptic language from the Trump campaign, to this morning Donald Trump on Fox News saying it didn't matter and that he was just sort of a leftist and that he welcomed Walls to the ticket. I mean, they've been all over the map here, but I think part of the value of having J.D. Vance on the trail today, playing the part of the kind of campaign attack dog or a little bit of a troll, as you saw him approach the vice president's plane today, making a joke about how it would be his future plane, is that with his military background, he's able to deliver those attacks on walls and the fact that walls did not deploy uh, to any of the war on terror locations, whereas Vance, as a uh, public affairs officer in the Marines, did. He can deliver those a, a little bit more cleanly than Trump, whose own uh, lack of military service has always dogged him as a political candidate. And this is, I think, a space that the Trump campaign is very very comfortable fighting on, in part because Chris LaCivita, who calls the shots for the Trump campaign, is the author of the swift boat attacks on John Kerry. This is very much uh, within their wheelhouse and something that I think they believe they can get some measure of traction on, even as the Harris campaign tries to push back. What about this uh, question of a debate or debates plural? Because Donald Trump alluded to that this morning, suggesting that maybe he's about to announce something as far as a debate with Vice President Harris. But, like, that's still a question mark, right? 
Yeah, look, Hallie, as I don't have to tell you who covered the Trump White House, being about to announce something is one of Donald Trump's favorite moves. There's going to be a plan in two weeks. We're going to have this very soon, and it'll be very powerful. Donald Trump is kind of a master of the of the suspenseful, keep you past the commercial break, stall or tease. And I think that's what you saw here today. I'm, a, I'm betting heavily uh, that there will be debates, uh, plural, perhaps only one with the top of the ticket, one with the bottom of the ticket, hmm. because I think all the campaigns for different reasons reasons think they need them. And if the numbers keep going the way they have been with Kamala Harris kind of continuing to ride high in the polls, Trump will look at what he saw in the last debate, the fact that he was able to knock Joe Biden out of it. He will look at uh, the sort of the confidence that he brings to all things campaign related and decided that he alone is the person who can turn things around and will probably agree to a debate on less favorable terms than what he's insisting on now, something at Fox News with an audience. A debate I think will happen at some point before people finish voting but perhaps not before they start sometime in late September. Garrett Haig, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. We'll be checking back in with you, I know, throughout the evening as well. So listen, one of the things that Garrett just laid out there, you heard the criticism from Senator J.D. Vance against Governor Tim Walz's military record. The attacks on Walz seem to be two-pronged. First, accusations that he, in the eyes of some, gave up on his battalion when he left the military after 24 years. And second, that he alleged he served in a combat zone when he did not, with some Republicans pointing to this moment. I spent 25 years in the Army and I hunt. And I gave the money back, and I'll tell you what I have been doing. I've been voting for common sense legislation that protects the Second Amendment, but we can do background checks. We can do CDC research. We can make sure we don't have reciprocal carry among states. And we can make sure that those weapons of war that I carried in war is the only place where those weapons are at. So, what is the reality? Walls served from 1981 to 2005 in the military. He then retired and ran for Congress. Walls has acknowledged in the past that he knows that others have done more in combat, that others have done more essentially than he had in the military as it relates to combat. Courtney Kuby is joining us now. Let me turn it over to you, Courtney, because you've been digging in on this all day. Can you give us the reality check here on Walls's military history? Yeah, so there's two real arguments that are being made about him. As you saw there, he served 24 years in the National Guard, first in Nebraska and then in Minnesota. Now, as during his time in the Minnesota National Guard as a senior non-commissioned officer, he did deploy as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. You'll remember in 2003, that was what the mission in Afghanistan was called. But what's critical here is he deployed forward to Europe, to Italy specifically, to support units that were deploying forward to Afghanistan. So he did not actually go to Afghanistan, but Hallie, the reality is he did deploy in support of that combat mission, that combat operation. But the, the one that is getting a little bit more attention is the, his, the second deployment by his unit. So fast forward to 2005, uh, just before his unit was mobilized to deploy to Iraq several months earlier, he decided to retire. Now, there are some members of that, his same battalion from the Minnesota National Guard, now retired, who are arguing that he decided to retire right before the deployment because he didn't want to go to Iraq. The reality is, Hallie, this is all, it, 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 you really need to ask Governor Walz himself why he retired at that time. It, it's impossible for us to know his motivation at that time. He retired in May of 2005. They mobilized and went uh, on for their workups and then deployed several months later. But this is really a, an, an issue of his motivation. The second issue that, that really has started to dog him and frankly has gained some traction, that's probably what, we, what Senator Vance was referring to in the soundbite you played earlier, what he called, quote, stolen valor garbage. It's another issue that's getting some attention, and that is the fact that if you look at Governor Walz's military record, his service record, he actually retired as a as a master, sar, a, a, not a command sergeant major, but a sergeant major. He went to school for part of the time, but retired before he actually became a command sergeant major, served in that role long enough to retire as that. His official biography on his website says he retired as a command sergeant major. That's another thing that people are arguing, specifically what we heard from Senator Vance today, Hallie. Courtney Kuby, thank you very much for the reality check. Appreciate it. Let's take it now to a stunning development from NASA today. You remember those two astronauts that were supposed to head up to the space station for 10 days and got held up for more than 60? Well, today NASA is saying they may have to be up there for another six months. Now, remember, SUNY Williams and Butch Wilmore flew to the ISS, the International Space Station, on the Boeing Starliner spacecraft back in June. 
a mission that was only supposed to be a week and a half, but the Starliner had some mechanical problems. So now NASA is weighing its options. It may have to tap Boeing's rival SpaceX to help bring these astronauts home. It's also acknowledging that at some point supplies may run short on what feels like the outer space reboot of Gilligan's Island. Our senior correspondent Tom Cassells went all over this. It's not a three hour tour. It was oh. a 10 day visit that has right. now turned into maybe, I mean, 63 days at least and maybe six months. How does six this- Six months more. This is what I'm saying. What do they do? I mean, do they have enough yeah. food? Do they have enough whatever that they so, need? So uh, it's still a, a possibility, but I gotta say, listening to the conference call today with NASA, a long hour and a half teleconference, they're clearly leaning in this direction. And the and here's the they got a whole bunch of problems and a whole bunch of caveats. But to your point, are they running out of supplies on the space station? Well, they now have two extra people on the space station using up the consumables. So yeah, they'd like to get them back. But take a look. Here's the timeline for this mission. And here's how it got all messed up. Remember, they launched back on June 5th, supposed to be 10-day mission to the space station. June 9th, NASA said they're going to delay Starliner's return. We need to work on some mechanical issues. June 14th, we're delaying again. June 21st, we're delaying again. June, July 25th, delaying again. And now, today, they say the Starliner crew, not just Starliner, but the crew may be delayed until February of 2025. The problem is there is a big internal debate within NASA, mission managers and engineers, over whether it's safe for them to come back on Starliner. You've got a big division of opinion on this, and imagine you're the executive at NASA, NASA chief Bill Nelson, who needs to come down and make a decision, yes or no, do they come back on Starliner or not? If, if you've got a, a big chunk of your engineers arguing no, boy, that's an awfully hard nut to crack yeah. if you have to say, I'm going to overrule those engineers. I think they're leaning towards this. So if they come home and they need SpaceX to come home, yeah. is that a bad look for Boeing? What an embarrassment. Okay. What an embarrassment. I mean, Elon Musk has eaten Boeing's lunch. There's no other way to say it. Listen, Boeing has now, th this is their first crewed, in other words, people on board, crewed mission to the space station. And I think we can now say they're stuck. NASA doesn't like to say they're stuck because they do have an emergency escape vehicle just in case, but they're stuck. Uh, in the meantime, guess how many missions, crewed missions, SpaceX has flown to the space station? Nine, nine so far, wow. not to mention all the cargo missions. I mean, SpaceX has a track record of success. Boeing is stumbling. They are years behind schedule, something like a billion and a half dollars over budget. Okay, so when are we going to know for sure what's going to happen with I think, them? Yeah, you're or like, is this the for sure moment? Uh, no, I think we're very close to okay. it. They were telegraphing it today, but officially I think that they're going to make that announcement probably mid to late next week. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when you and I were sitting here at this very desk and you were talking through how, how Boeing and NASA were saying, hey, they're not stuck. We can yeah. get home anytime if we needed to. And then it felt like the worm started to turn yeah. a little bit. Well, I, listen, I started saying to people at NASA, give me a break. At a certain point, if you're stuck in the mall for months on end, okay, you could steal somebody's car to come home, but you're stuck because your car is broken. Aren't you kind of stuck? They take uh, issue with that, but at a certain point, come on, guys, they're kind of stuck. They're safe. They're safe. They're safe. That's fine. Yeah. But eight months when you thought you were going for 10 days, Boy. I think they're stuck. I hope they got plenty of, plenty of uh, uh, clothes to, to last them through those things. I guess they're in space suits. But anyways, uh, Tom Castillo, <laughs> thank you. Just crazy. It's crazy to think about. Crazy Appreciate with a that. capital C. So listen, we want to take you now to some other news making headlines tonight, including in Milwaukee, where the widow of a man who died after being pinned down by hotel workers there says charges against the men involved should not have taken as long as they did, but that they're a step in the right direction. Listen. Do I feel like it's enough? No but it's a start. I want them to be charged to the full extent of the law. They had no, no remorse for him. They, they, they didn't haul it out. They, they punished him. This is one of the four men facing felony murder charges in connection to Devontae Mitchell's death. Todd Erickson, who turned himself in today. Mitchell died in late June after employees grabbed him and held him face down on the ground outside the hotel. We will show you video one time of those moments with a warning here that the footage is very hard to watch. Police say somebody had gone into the hotel and in their words caused a disturbance. You can see what looks like workers dragging him outside and then holding him to the ground. According to the complaint, he was held down for eight to nine minutes. Antonia Hilton is joining us now. The city's mayor is also joining these calls for some level of accountability tonight as well. What else are we hearing from Mitchell's family and what they want to see happen? 
Well, Hallie, our team got time to speak with both his brother and his widow, who everyone just saw right there. His brother described this moment as bittersweet. They are grateful for these charges coming down, but they also, of course, wish that none of this was happening to them at all. The widow described Devante as a teddy bear, basically, as someone who was loved as not violent. And you could see just on her face how challenging it has been for them to process what's happened here. You know, this is for all of them um, and really everyone in the broader community there. It is sort of doubly traumatizing because it has such a connection to what people saw happen to George Floyd years ago, four years ago. People are making those comparisons. Um, and of course, what's different here is this is hotel staff. So we're talking to security guards, a bellhop, and a front desk attendant, not police officers, but similar questions raised about accountability, about training in those cases. Take a listen to the widow describing some of this for herself. Everybody goes through what they go through. He deserved more than what they gave him. And he still deserves more than what they're giving him now. He was great. He wasn't violent. He, he wasn't combative. He, he wasn't argumentative. He wasn't any of these things. He was a big bear, a big teddy bear. His mother has also indicated that the family believes he was likely dealing with some kind of mental health challenges. We know from authorities in the hotel that they described a disturbance in the lobby before everything that you see in the video unfolds. And so I think we're going to find out more in the coming days how he was actually doing, his frame of mind, more of the family's story. But certainly right now, attention is on this investigation and these charges, Hallie. We're also now hearing from an employee about how he says this happened. Um, can you talk through that? That's right. Uh, our affiliate spoke with Herbert Williamson, the bellhop. And it's really rare to get people who have been charged with felony murder to speak often, but he spoke to our affiliate and he said that he was numb, that he believes he is innocent, and that he was essentially just following what his supervisors had told him to do. And so I think that's part of the story that's coming here, Hallie, is the kind of training provided to these employees, what kinds of directions they might have received from people who are not actually on camera. There's definitely more to come here. And Tony Hilton, thank you very much. Coming up, new warnings tonight around e-cigarettes, why scientists say some tobacco companies are using basically untested chemicals. Plus, a dramatic rescue in Florida, how police found a missing five-year-old in the middle of a pond. We're going to show you those moments in just a sec. The family of a French explorer who died in that Titan submersible implosion last year is today filing a $50 million lawsuit against the sub's operator. Paul-Henri Narjolet was one of five people killed when the submersible imploded about two hours into a trip down to the Titanic wreck site. Remember, the Titan was owned by this company called Oceansgate that took tourists to visit the Titanic and which suspended operations last July, less than three weeks after the implosion happened. An Oceangate spokesperson is declining to comment on the suit. Danny Savalos is joining us now. This explorer was no Titanic wreck rookie. The suit says he was part of 37 dives to the Titanic, the most of any diver in the world. He was considered an expert. So walk us through the legalities here, because didn't Oceangate require customers to sign something that specifically mentioned the possibility of death? Reportedly, yes, but waivers are an obstacle. They're not always an insurmountable obstacle. There are ways of getting around them. For example, if some of the hazards uh, that actually caused the harm weren't really disclosed. Like, for example, I doubt that waiver says anything about, hey, if there's some structural problem with this uh, submersible, that's not on you. That's not on us. That's your thing to worry about. That's the kind of thing that you might be able to, if true, show that the waiver is no good. So if the potential damages are significant enough, plaintiff's attorneys, including me, will sometimes proceed even when you have a waiver that seems to apparently absolve the company, the defendant of all, all responsibility. Why did it take so long to file the suit? Is that typical in an instance like this, more than a year after this implosion happened? It is typical. Washington State okay. has a three-year personal injury statute of limitations. And then, similarly, the Jones Act, which is the uh, Maritime Act that this is also filed under, also has a three-year statute of limitations. So they were nowhere close to running out of time. And you often wait, I often wait, uh, up to a year just to sort of do your investigation and figure out where your damages are, get your ducks lined up, and file the best complaint that you can, especially in a case like this where you have a waiver to deal with. You really want to do a little investigation to make sure 
sure you have enough facts to get over or beyond that waiver if, in fact, there is one that applies to this claim. So then how would you, if you had to handicap the chances of this lawsuit moving forward, how would you? I'd put them at high. I mean, okay. if they filed it, then they feel confident they can get past the waiver. The defense will probably move to throw the case out based on the waiver and based on maybe some other things. But uh, ultimately, if it survives that motion, then in all likelihood, most civil cases don't go to trial. They usually end up settling. Uh, that's just playing the odds. That's where a lot of cases like this usually end up. Danny Savalos, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, new dramatic time-lapse video of the Park Fire in California. Look at this, that super thick smoke just blanketing the sky. The fires burned more than 420,000 acres so far, destroying more than 600 buildings. It's about 34% contained as of today. Number two, multiple Delta passengers are filing a class action lawsuit today against Delta after all that flight chaos from that meltdown. Remember that last month, the global tech outage? Thousands of Delta flights had to be canceled or delayed. Passengers say the airline refused or added conditions to, re to refund requests. Delta did not immediately return to our request for comment. Number three, at the top of the hour, we're talking about the uh, story of the questions over Tim Walz's military service. The Harris campaign saying in a statement here, and I'm quoting, in his 24 years of service, the governor carried, fired, and trained others to use weapons of war innumerable times. Governor Walls would never insult or undermine any American service to this country. In fact, he thanks Senator Vance for putting his life on the line for our country. It's the American way. And in another statement, the Harris camp pointed out Walls has been a tireless advocate for men and women in uniform. Number four, an amazing rescue out of Florida. Look at this, a county deputy sprinting into this big pond to save a five-year-old boy who got out of his house through a second-story door. That set off an alarm. The family called 911. Ugh, police went out to check. They found the boy hanging onto a log, just clinging to it. He is fortunately now back home, safe and sound. Such a relief. Number five, Dolce & Gabbana launching a new perfume, but this one comes with a twist. The twist is that the perfume is not for you, it's for your best friend. Fifi is the perfume's name. And yes, it is a perfume for dogs. <laughs> it costs uh, just over $100. Some vets are not happy with it, saying it may interfere with dogs' sense of smell or cover up certain odors that could be a symptom of disease. Would you drop that kind of cash on a dog perfume? Let me know. Let's get to some new research out today. Finding some tobacco companies are using chemicals that mimic nicotine and potentially getting around health regulations. According to Duke scientists, these companies are essentially replacing nicotine with mostly untested chemicals that basically do the same thing in order to dodge nicotine rules. These products also have things like flavors and sweeteners, things that health experts say could attract younger people or like non-vapors into the scene. Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now. What's up? What are these? What do we know about these chemicals? How much of them are in these products? And should we be, you know, super concerned about it or what? Yeah, so these uh, these researchers, Hallie, they looked at two uh, different major brands of these e-cigarettes, and they were really concentrating on two different chemicals that were in there. One of them is called 6-methyl nicotine, and the other one is, is called nicotinamide. And what these are, as you mentioned, are kind of like nicotine analogs, meaning they're, very, they're kind of chemically similar, but they're different enough insofar as they haven't been studied and they are not FDA regulated. And what they found was, specifically for the 6-methyl nicotine, that is considerably more toxic and more potent than regular regular nicotine. They actually found in one particular product that there was less than that was on the product uh, label. But what they also found, Hallie, which is concerning, is that, as you said, they may contain sweeteners. They might contain coolants. And experts don't know the mix of that, especially when these e-cigarettes are heated up, how much potential damage that could cause to the user. So if you're trying to stop uh, to, to you know, stop smoking by vaping, essentially, which is something that's not super uncommon, what should you be looking for? And I want to highlight one thing, is that the research does show that the use of e-cigarettes, regular use of e-cigarettes, does result in smoking cessation of what we call regular cigarettes or combustible cigarettes. But I want to be very, very clear about this. The FDA very firmly states that there is no such thing as a safe tobacco product, and e-cigarettes are considered tobacco products because nicotine derives from tobacco. So, look, I mean, if you are a smoker and you want to quit smoking and you're using an e-cigarette, by all means, but you need to educate yourself about proper use of the battery, proper use of the liquid, um, and to be aware that there are significant harms that can come from e-cigarettes, including significant lung injury. You need to educate yourself if you're going to use this for 
for smoking cessation period. Okay, Dr. Natalie Azar, uh, good words of wisdom. Appreciate that. When we come back, the UK on high alert tonight for the possibility of more violence after days of riots. We'll tell you where thousands of counter protesters are now gathering and what Elon Musk has to do with it. Plus, a scary moment captured on camera. Look at this in Oklahoma. We'll tell you what officials say that dog was chewing on that started a fire. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, homicide detectives are investigating an alleged road rage fight that left one man dead in West Hollywood. Apparently, this fight started in the parking lot you're looking at after two people were involved in a minor crash. Police don't think that there were any weapons involved, but both men were taken to the hospital where one of them later died. Officials now want anybody with more info to call police. Out of our Southern Bureau, some new video of a house that caught on fire in Oklahoma. Look at this. One of the dogs in the house started chewing apparently on a lithium ion battery, similar, you know, to the ones you use to charge your phone. It sparked, it exploded into flames. Thankfully, the pets made it out safely through a doggy door, but fire officials say, hey, this is a warning. Store your batteries in a spot where your pets can't get to them. Out of our Northeast Bureau, broken wind turbines leaving debris all over a beach in Cape Cod. And it's not the first time. Little pieces like this have been washing up on several beaches in Massachusetts. The wind turbine company is sending cleanup crews to the area to get it all taken care of. Let's take you overseas with the UK on high alert tonight with thousands of police fanned out across the country after days of chaos fueled by anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant sentiment after that knife attack that left three girls dead. But what you see here are thousands of anti-racist counter-protesters gathering in some of those same places where police have been deployed, protesting now against the violence in the country that's lasted for something like a week. Those riots fueled by disinformation that quickly spread online in the wake of that attack, where the suspect was wrongly identified as an asylum seeker who had just arrived in the UK. Josh Letterman is joining us now. Josh, officials have been planning for the worst, so what's it like tonight, right now where you are? I know it's after midnight, I think, in London. Yeah, that's right. I just left a protest that got eventually dispersed by the police. It was one of about 100 protests that were expected tonight. The really interesting thing, Hallie, at this protest and at several others that NBC visited tonight, there were far more counter-protesters than there were protesters. In other words, the vast majority of people who showed up were there to show solidarity with migrants and to show that these uh, violent protesters and rioters who are speaking out against uh, Muslims and immigrants do not represent them. I want you to hear from Bethany, uh, one protester who showed up in northern London tonight uh, who came out to show that she does support migrants. Take a listen. There's no logic behind it. There's no critical thinking behind it. These people don't know why they're angry. They put one and one together. They got five. They're angry at the state of the country, but they don't know why. So get educated. And Hallie, as police are trying to get this situation under control, they keep adding new tools to their toolbox. So now they have uh, some 4,000 police officers who are poised to deal with these riots. They're increasing that to 6,000 by the end of the week. They've also enacted what's called Section 60 powers in the UK, which essentially allows the police in certain areas to stop and search whoever they want with essentially no pretext if they think that it can help to reduce this violence. Uh, and Josh, you know, and I should have said it's, it's pushing midnight there where you are, but the disinformation piece of this has been a factor, obviously. Social media, there's an Elon Musk connection to some of this as well that seems to be bubbling up. What's up with that? Yeah, Elon Musk has really been fanning the flames here in the UK. He has said that civil war is inevitable, that the UK is becoming like the Soviet Union, and he has sharply criticized Keir Starmer, the new prime minister, uh, for trying to protect uh, Muslim communities, saying essentially, what about all communities? He is accusing Keir Starmer of having a double standard to far-right groups, uh, as he has been posting stuff kind of in support of many of those far-right groups. Now, the British government obviously is very upset about that, but part of this has to do with the fact that it was disinformation on social media uh, after that stabbing attack last week that has fueled this. The UK government says they're actually going to go after the social media companies for allowing that kind of disinformation on their platforms, Allie. Josh Letterman, thank you very much. Uh, glad you're bringing us up to speed on that. Appreciate it. Coming up, we're taking you to Paris and a pretty big day for Team USA at the Olympics. Guess who's back tonight, folks? It's Keir Simmons. He's standing by. He's probably climbing the Eiffel Tower as we speak, getting ready for this live shot and what his favorite moment of the day is as we talk all things Olympians.
next. Yes. The United States bringing home some more medals at the Olympics today uh, in athletics. Uh, Quickie, excuse me, Quincy Hall bringing home gold for Team USA in the men's 400 meter. This was a wild race. And then in the women's pole vault, you had American Katie Moon taking home the silver with a vault of just under 16 feet, 4.85 meters. And then there's this artistic swimming routine that helped Team USA win a silver medal. That's the first medal that the artistic swimmers have won in like 20 years. Big day for Team USA. A big day for our dear friend, Keir Simmons, who's live for us tonight in Paris to break it all down for us, Keir. Let's I just get into it, my friend. It. I just finished watching the artistic swimming. Drama. Wow. I mean, it was, it's drama, it's wow. beautiful, and it's a big deal. First time in a couple decades that the U.S. has won. And I tell you something as well. I, 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 do you watch artistic swimming much? I don't know. It's got. Maybe do, I missed something. I, I, I feel like the last time I was like 10 years old that I watched yours. I don't know. But like, it's gone full gangster. I mean, it's like <laughs> I, the, the, the faces, the contortions, and the music. It's it's like Japan did uh, Eminem for the whole routine. Canada did a medley of Eminem and and, and Dre and Snoop. Um, the, the, I tell you, sometimes though it, it makes me anxious. Um, they come up out of the water, and some of the women are so, women so red faced. I, I, I'm thinking this is a, this is a dangerous sport. Maybe it is a dangerous. I, I don't know. It's it's, it's so intense. It's really it's so really athletic. really yeah. impressive. So intense. And then as you said, uh, Team USA just just in the past few minutes almost got gold. They were they were penultimate. They were second to last to perform. They were in first place. And then how about this for geopolitics? Then China comes in, incredible routine, and they push uh, Team USA into second place. They have also they have the things on the noses, which is. Uh, you know, they just have these contraptions on their noses that, that um, I, I think you probably have to do that when you're under the water so much and diving in and out and things. But, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing sport. It's incredible. Um, also incredible. Was, Noah Lyles. That was my Everybody's analysis. Did you like that? was my expert analysis right there. You <laughs> I thought, you were, just, I thought of, you, you were know, just yapping, Kier. I thought you were just riffing. It, you know what I mean? In. Just like <laughs> chit-chatting a little <laughs> <Just> bit. Riffing. <laughs> can we talk about, wait, can we talk about Noah Lyles? Because that's drama too. Yeah. He, he's so amazing. He's right. now going to be already, you know, a, a crusher. He's now going to go to the 200 meter um, yeah. final tomorrow, right? Like that, and that's a significant yeah. thing too. Yeah, and if he manages to do that, that's the first time, as we mentioned last time we spoke, since 1984 and Carl and Lewis for, for Team uh, USA. Of course, you had Usain Bolt uh, pulling that off a number of times in previous uh, Olympics. Uh, but, yeah, now Noah Lyles, I mean, he's on the edge of glory, isn't he? he, he he's, and he's so, uh, he's such a performer. I've said it before, on the track and then off the track. So, I mean, I can't wait for that race. Um, it's, it's a big one, uh, and it's a big one not least because he is just, he's that kind of sprinter that really um, you know makes you want to watch um, and and just kind of want to you want to see what he does and how he how he uh, reacts when he when he when he manages it we'll just see it's so tight it's so there's, yeah. there, are, there are you know fractions of a second in this thing um, okay we have to get to of course our favorite part of the day which is the Kier yeah. favorite moment what it what was it yeah. today for you what was your number one what, moment what did you like the what, best well I, I prepared, but it was going to be artistic swimming, and then you, and when we we, we, we kicked off with artistic, so now I'm lost you again. You were quite prepared. You were really well prepared I, on the artistic swimming. Yeah, I was, I was, because that was going to be my. Anyway, listen, didn't happen today, but I love that Team USA beat. Germany in the soccer and why okay. because I'm English and in the end <laughs> anyone who beats Germany in soccer is all right with me it, it's, it's pretty good and I'm willing to swallow the fact that you know you guys win at everything and do you have to win at soccer as well uh, you know and also <laughs> that the fact that you guys start doing well in soccer again which of course hasn't happened since back in 2012 you know robs me of the ability to say you know condescendingly say to you know my US friends you know that game soccer where you kick a ball around and there's like a, you know a net and 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 by the way uh, there's no commercial there's only one commercial break how about that? That, that you know I don't get to do all that when you guys are winning so hey, but it's still my favorite favorite thing Kira, I think the Olympics is the only time where you're allowed to get away with calling your colleagues you guys here uh, across the pond here in the U.S. Uh, th thanks, I guess. Uh, we're looking forward to that match, of course. I think it's on Saturday, right? The gold, the gold medal match for the women's soccer. Right. Okay. Right. Kira exactly Simmons. Right. Yeah. I, too bad right. we don't have a show on Saturday. Maybe we can just like get together, yeah. FaceTime a little, watch it, and riff. In yeah, that let's do it. Let's do it. Unplugged.
Thank you. Kira Simmons, appreciate you, friend. Live for us tonight in Paris. Still to come, some new research suggesting just how the Great Pyramids were actually built in Egypt. And here's a hint, wasn't aliens. Some new research now puts out a novel theory on how the Great Pyramids in Egypt were actually built, a mystery that has baffled people for literally hundreds of years. Archaeologists now say the ancient Egyptians may have harnessed the power of water to float these huge stone blocks hundreds of feet in the air. That's what this new research says, but not everybody is convinced. NBC's David Noriega has more. The age-old question. How did the Egyptians build the pyramids? Perplexing historians all the way back to ancient Greece, stumping Napoleon's archaeologists, and becoming the butt of jokes today. Did this start at the top and work down, or start at the bottom and work up? Although we're fairly sure they started at the bottom, we still don't know exactly how they did it. There are all kinds of theories. Ramps, cranes, and yes, aliens. Probably extraterrestrials. Now we're getting a new potential answer, one a little more grounded in reality. Water. Researchers just published a study suggesting that hydraulic force could have helped build the step pyramid for Pharaoh Djoser more than 4,600 years ago. It's the oldest of the seven monumental pyramids in Egypt and was at the time the largest structure, coming in at 204 feet. That's King, or Pharaoh, LeBron James, stacked head to toe more than 30 times. Some of those stones weighing more than 600 pounds. The researchers now say the internal architecture of the pyramid supports a new theory, a hydraulic lift. A nearby structure might have functioned as a dam. Water could have flowed into shafts inside the pyramid that would have raised some sort of float carrying the stones like a water elevator. They say the discovery represents a significant leap in our comprehension of ancient Egyptian engineering. The question is, where would the water have come from? Researchers say the area used to be more of a savanna than a desert, getting a lot more rain than it does now. But some experts are skeptical. I think it's extremely unlikely, to say the least. John Darnell is a professor of Egyptology at Yale. We don't have any evidence for the Egyptians making use of, let's say, water pressure or understanding or exploiting that. It would be very difficult to do that using the structures they're describing because the enclosure would leach water into the desert. The researchers behind the new study say there's more to investigate. They're looking into whether other pyramids could have been built in a similar way, from the inside out. So in many ways, it all remains a mystery. And alien watchers can keep their eyes on the skies. David Noriega, NBC News. The more you know, that does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. We're coming on the air tonight with some breaking news. Officials saying Taylor Swift shows in Vienna this week will be canceled because of a thwarted terror plot out of concern for people's safety. That's why the shows are off, they say. What we know about how police stopped the suspects allegedly planning to target the huge crowds set to support one of the world's biggest stars. Plus, here at home, look at this. Some new video of a tornado touching down in North Carolina just as we've been on the air. This is some of the damage with millions of people bracing for Storm Debbie to make landfall yet again maybe it's an even stronger system. We've got our team live on the ground with more on this and what's ahead. Then the battleground blitz for the new Democratic ticket on the road, on the tarmac, and then again, so is J.D. Vance. Why he walked up to Vice President Harris's plane today, plus new into us just tonight, President Biden's concerns that there may not be a peaceful transfer of power after this election. We've got that new interview coming up in just a sec. Plus, the startling reveal from NASA and Boeing on those astronauts who say they aren't really stuck in space. Turns out they may be not stuck for another six full months. What's next now and how a 10-day trip turned into half a year in what sounds like a bad outer space reboot of Gilligan's Island later in the show? Then, how big tobacco may be trying to dodge health rules, the mostly untested chemicals they could be putting in their products, according to experts. That's coming up. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we are starting with that news out of Vienna, where officials say that they are canceling multiple Taylor Swift shows, part of her era's tour, out of safety concerns. That's after police there say they uncovered an ISIS-linked terror plot, arresting two men connected to it, and potentially narrowly avoiding a horrific nightmare. 
Now, the company in charge of selling those concert tickets, writing on its website that organizers had no choice but to cancel for everyone's safety. You see it there. So this is what Swift's website looks like right now. Under each of the different concert dates, again, set to happen later on this week, it says all tickets will be automatically refunded within the next 10 business days. The shows were supposed to start tomorrow night. Important to note here. The attack was not directly targeting the singer herself, but officials say they did specifically, the planning honed in on her concerts. Federal and state police in Austria say it was part of a plan to attack big events across Vienna. They said the men they arrested were apparently radicalized through the Internet, but the search is still on for anybody who may know more about this. Tom Winter has been following the developments that have come pretty fast and furious over the course of the last maybe 90 minutes or so. So get us up to speed, Tom. Where do things stand in this investigation? Right, Hallie. Well, it's our understanding, according to two U.S. officials briefed on the investigation, that Austrian law enforcement is looking for at least another individual or individuals who may have had some knowledge about this plot uh, prior to it obviously occurring or prior to the arrests being made earlier today in Austria. So that's the primary concern right now. What they know about this plot, I think they feel like they're in a pretty good position to understand it, because there was some surveillance that took place prior to this. That's how they knew about these individuals. That's why they knew that they were focused in on major events, as you just said, but specifically the Taylor Swift concert. That was definitely uh, something that the, at least the 19-year-old was focused on, somebody who had become radicalized online, as you said, and had pledged allegiance to ISIS several weeks ago. So that's what we know uh, as far as these suspects are concerned. Uh, and the investigation, I think, going forward here is trying to determine how many others might be involved and what are the links between these people. And that's something they're focused on. Okay, so talk about the sort of Taylor Swift of it all here, because unless I'm mistaken, and I haven't looked at my phone in the last like eight minutes, she has not responded on this herself. Um, but what do officials say about, the, about the, 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 the plot? Because it didn't target her specifically, but it did target really big crowds, and we know that she draws really big crowds. Oh, I mean, for sure. And not only that, but Taylor Swift has a reputation of not just drawing the people that are going to the concert, but thousands to tens of thousands of other people. And that's something police talked about today. 65,000 people inside the state. Stadium, another 10, 15, maybe 25,000 that were going to be in Vienna uh, for this concert, visiting and spending time on the streets there. That was definitely a, a big component of their concern and why they were going to be, prior to the canceling of these concerts, so aggressive with their security plans. Okay, so what is sort of the level of concern that officials say, you know, re regular people in Vienna, if you will, fans at shows, fans at big events moving forward, um, w w how, do, how do they calibrate this moment? I think they're going to look at this investigation and what other information they derive from it and these other potential individuals uh, who they could be looking for. But look, Hallie, we saw some specific, credible, real plots and threats to the Olympics that were taken down, arrests were made by French officials. We've seen what we've just seen in the last 24 hours in Austria. We know what the FBI director has told us here at NBC News on the record. There is clearly a high threat environment that escalated prior to October 7th when Hamas attacked Israel, but has only increased and significantly so since that time period. Everybody in the counterterrorism community remains deeply concerned. Tom Winter, thank you very much for bringing us the latest on this. I know you're working the phones still. We'll let you get back to it. Got to get to some breaking news down south now, where we're just seeing the damage from a tornado that apparently touched down in North Carolina. We don't know how strong it was, but we do know that some houses got badly damaged. You see some of this. A building collapsed. You see the roof ripped off that house there. This is Sampson County. Fortunately, so far as we know, nobody has been hurt. It comes as hundreds of thousands of people are bracing for Tropical Storm Debbie to strengthen again and then slam the East Coast for the second time in less than a week, possibly triggering more of the dangerous kind of flooding that you just saw. Look at this. This is uh, the parking lot of an Arby's. You see the chairs flipped. You see in other shots, roads turned to rivers in some places. All of it is happening, of course, as our weather team is telling us that this storm is creeping up the coast, bringing with it the possibility of intense flash flooding, a huge storm surge, and again, even maybe tornadoes. We saw that one in North Carolina. What is yet to come? And you see that path? maybe hundreds of miles north of even where I'm sitting here in Washington, in New York and New Jersey. It's a different storm system, but one that is fueled and boosted by Debbie, with people there having to be rescued after storms and flooding, too. Maggie Vespa is with us in South Carolina, but let me start actually with Bill Karens, our meteorologist. What's going on with this North Carolina tornado? Um, one of the states set to be hit hard by sort of new Debbie, or Debbie Part 2, if you will. Is it all related? 
Uh, it is, and we expect these on those outer bands. And this is very common when we have even tropical storms or hurricanes. You, have, you saw some pictures there from South Carolina. We had a couple of last night, uh, and then also the one that we saw there today. And the damage, if we want to roll those pictures again, is what you'd expect from a tropical system producing a tornado. These are not usually tornadoes that will take the whole foundation, you know, the house down to the foundation like you get in the big, huge ones in the springtime. This is usually tornadoes that are EF zeros, EF ones. They move quickly. They form quickly, and then they also dissipate quickly, and we get a lot of roof damage, tree damage, windows smashed out, you know, very similar to the pictures that we showed there of the Arby. So here's a view of the radar, and this tornado watch, so if we get storms like that that could produce isolated tornadoes, it would be in this coastal plain from the Nor Myrtle Beach area to Wilmington, uh, Jacksonville, Camp Lejeune area, up towards New Bern, Havelock, and a little portion here towards Atlantic Beach, uh, and not quite out to Cape Hatteras. This is out a tornado watch until 11 o'clock and it's with these bands these isolated storms this if they did occur Hallie this is where they would be this is the Wilmington area here so we'll keep a close eye on that and as we go throughout the night that tornado threat will eventually push inland too. Well Karen thank you very much let me go to Maggie Vespa who has obviously been in the path in South Carolina there with FEMA saying they've put hundreds of people hundreds of staffers in the area to be ready for what's next talk us through right. Exactly. Well, what's next, as you've been saying, is essentially round two, act two for Debbie, who's basically strengthening offshore. And we know that when these hurricanes, and Bill can speak to this more, but when they basically get over warmer water, they get that much stronger. It's kind of like, well, here the storm comes again. Areas like this that got hit in round one, and we're in Charleston right now, they are so saturated. I want to show you video. We have video of kind of that pump system that we showed you in the last hour when it was really just gushing water back into the Charleston Harbor. That's water that had been captured in the city underground storm water system. They're basically trying to like drain the city to get ready for more rainfall when they expect this to pick back up really overnight. We've been told by our climate team that Debbie should kind of hit this area around 2 a.m. So the rain that you see right now is just like a preview of this act two. So with that in mind, local officials have had a lot of press conferences over the last couple of days. This latest one stressing to people that we went through round one, right? Well, don't let your guard down just yet because Debbie is coming back. Here's some of what we heard. We've been lucky so far. Things have not been as bad as they could have been, although we've, we've had a lot of rain and it's uh, not nearly over. Its greatest impacts will still be the potential for considerable flash flooding and significant long-term river flooding. Yeah, and to put it into context here, we've had well over a foot of rain here in parts of the Carolinas, including uh, near Charleston, where we are. It could, according to some projections, potentially double with close to two feet of rain or possibly more than that uh, in sort of parts of this region. And the biggest thing officials say, Hallie, is that regions or uh, parts of the city in Charleston that don't normally flood could very easily flood during this round, too. So they're asking everybody to really be on guard this time. Yeah, that is for sure. Maggie, live for us there in Charleston. Charleston. Thanks, Maggie. Appreciate it. To politics now with the rubber meeting the road for the newly minted Democratic ticket on the road as we speak now. I want to show you a live look at that rally in Detroit, the second of a couple stops today for Vice President Kamala Harris and Minnesota Governor Tim Walz set to take the stage together, we think, in like the next maybe half hour or so uh, with some performances on stage now. They were just in Wisconsin earlier today to rally there with chants erupting for President Biden saying, listen to this. Thank you, Joe. Listen. That's right. You hear that? Thank you, Joe. I'm obviously a nod to President Biden and his withdrawal from the race and a nod to his, obviously, time in office from those Democrats there. As the president is now giving his first interview since deciding to drop out of the race. Listen to this. This is with CBS. Are you confident that there will be a peaceful transfer of power in January 2025? If Trump wins, no, I'm not confident at all. I mean, if Trump loses, I'm not confident at all. He means what he says. We don't take him seriously. He means it. All the stuff about if we lose, there'll be a bloodbath. It's it will have to be a stolen election. Look what they're trying to do now in the local election districts where people count the votes. They're elected, they're putting people in place in states that are, they're going to count the votes, right? You can't love your country only when you win. 
We are expecting to hear more of that interview between Bob Costa there from CBS and President Biden later on tonight. But in the meantime, you got this split screen moment with the campaign really on both sides of the aisle, focusing on these Rust Belt battlegrounds, Michigan, where the Democrats are tonight and Wisconsin, where they were a couple hours ago. By the way, you see the other guy in those little mini boxes there. That's, of course, the GOP vice presidential pick, J.D. Vance. At one point, he was on the same like airport, same tarmac. He walked up to Air Force Two the vice president's plane, saying he wanted to check out his future plane. So with the race set, the tickets in place, the question of who Harris's running mate will be out of the way, there's some other big questions now emerging, like if and when will Walls and Vance, who are already going after each other on the campaign trail, will they hit the debate stage and face off? Can Walls's small town Midwestern background bring over more voters to the Democratic side as the Harris campaign hopes? They're pointing to a lot of energy, a lot of momentum. They say they've raised over $36 million in the 24 hours after announcing Walls as the pick. The top profession giving, by the way, they say was teachers. And then how will Democrats try to define Tim Walls, who polling shows is relatively unknown to a whole lot of Americans right now, as Republicans are also working to define him in a very different way? Not, uh, neither side has a lot of time. Because you know this is a supercharged sprint. May not feel like it, but the election's coming up quick, folks. It is only 90 days away. We've got team coverage. Garrett Haig with the latest from the Trump campaign in Michigan. But I want to start with Mon Courtney QB is joining us as well. But I want to start with Monica Alba live for us at the White House. And Mon, let's start with some of these new comments from President Biden here. Somebody who has stepped off of the ticket. He has in many ways stepped out of the spotlight to allow Kamala Harris to take that stage, to tout, of course, her new running mate. She is the, the leader of this ticket now. Um, but some, some news made here as he is again casting what he sees as a threat to democracy as it relates to former President Trump. And this was a founding principle of Joe Biden's candidacy in 2020, Hallie. This overall concern about the state of our democracy, the battle for the soul of the nation. He talked about that repeatedly after Charlottesville. And then after January 6th happened, he also made this argument. This was one of his most major concerns and why he wanted to run for reelection before deciding to exit the race. But that is kind of the message that you saw him hinting at and talking about in this interview here, this concern about what could happen happen and raising this idea that there could be some potential political violence, which he has spoken out against for really the last three and a half years pretty regularly and pretty repeatedly. But you're right, he's no longer a candidate. And instead, now he's approaching this as the president of the United States, as the current commander in chief, still doing his day job, but still weighing in on some of these key political questions. And I think it's notable that he's raising this as an issue, but it's not one that he is saying he has a direct role in trying to determine whether that is going to be the case in terms of whether Donald Trump is defeated or not in November. That is now up to, he said, essentially Vice President Harris and Governor Tim Wall. So it's this really fascinating moment where we haven't seen much of President Biden in the last couple of days. He has had certainly internal meetings and calls and other work he's doing behind the scenes to try to get the ceasefire deal potentially over the finish line in the Middle East, for example. But it's one where he clearly did want to deliver some kind of a message here and more answers about why he did in the end decide to not go forward with his reelection bid, Hallie. Let's talk about the campaign now, too, because I know that uh, our colleagues are out there on the campaign trail with this fight for these Rust Belt battlegrounds playing out in very real time. And some new polling coming in from, Mich uh, from Wisconsin, I should say, one of the stops today, showing that this race really isn't a dead heat in that battleground. It's incredibly tight, and when you look at this new poll from Marquette in particular, it's effectively exactly that. It's locked at in with registered voters, 50% for Donald Trump, 49% for Kamala Harris, and with likely voters, 50% for her, 49% for him. And you're seeing this pattern emerge in the last couple of days and weeks as we have seen her become the top of the ticket, where some of these battleground states where the former president had a little bit more of an advantage, there is now a bit of a tightening there. But as we we know very well, Hallie, these polls are still totally within the margin of error, so it's hard to extrapolate completely, but it's momentum Democrats are trying to seize on. Monica Alba, live for us at the White House. Thank you. Let's take you out to the campaign trail where Garrett Hake is posted up. And you, of course, cover the, the Trump-Vance campaign as they go up against what is now the Harris-Walls campaign. And what we're seeing from both of these VP picks now, both Governor Walls and Senator Vance, both of them are taking on that kind of traditional attack dog role, if you will, of, of what that usually is when you are the VP candidate. Let me play some of the back and forth that we've heard in just the last, you know, eight hours or so. 
Just like all of us in regular America, we, uh, we go to Yale, and then we have our careers funded by Silicon Valley billionaires, and then you write a book about the place you grew up, and you trash that place. What bothers me about Tim Waltz is the stolen valor garbage. Do not pretend to be something that you're not. I'd be ashamed if I was him and I lied about my military service like he did. Talk about uh, the way that this race is shaping up as it relates to these two, particularly as J.D. Vance is by far the more visible uh, of the people on the ticket, on the, on the Trump ticket, given that the former president phoned into an interview this morning. But it's been Vance who's been out there in public doing this counter-programming. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. You're seeing the Trump campaign deploy Vance in a very traditional way here, bracketing the Democratic ticket, essentially following them around the country, doing these very small events, mostly geared toward the media, essentially trying to troll his way into mostly the local television headlines about the trips that the, the Democratic ticket is taking to these places. That's why you saw him approaching the campaign plane on the tarmac in Wisconsin. It's a little bit of a stunt campaign here, but it is meant to kind of keep the Trump campaign in the mix, even in a moment that is being dominated by the vice presidential rollout on the Democratic side. And you saw a little bit of this today from Vance with the variety of attacks that he tried to deploy against the Harris campaign and against Tim Walls. There's a little something for everybody. Some policy attacks on immigration and on public safety, on inflation, on the price of gas and groceries, on Tim Walls' record in the National Guard, suggesting that Walls has artificially claimed uh, that he is, uh, you know, a combat veteran when he is not. And even, you know, kind of continuing to stir the pot about the Republican or the Democratic ticket, including uh, 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 Josh Shapiro, who wasn't picked to be on it. I tried to press him about the claims that he and other Republicans have made that somehow the uh, non selection of Shapiro was based on anti Semitism. I want to play what he told me. Do you have any evidence to support that assertion that a person who's married to a Jewish man is somehow anti Semitic or bowing to anti Semites? Kamala Harris was motivated, or at least her party was motivated by anti-Semitism. And the evidence that I offer for that is what dozens of Democratic activists said in the run-up to her selecting her nominee. Allie, here you see another effort to kind of drive a wedge between elements of the Democratic coalition, particularly Jewish voters and those who disagree with the way the war on Gaza has been handled. Uh, we will see if that continues to have legs or if that story fades into the background with the wall's uh, selection moving forward. It's all potential fodder, though, for a debate, if there is a debate. Yeah, look, my money still says there will be. I think Vance was picked in part for his ability to be an effective communicator of what Donald Trump wants to do with a second term. And Tim Walls was picked for his ability to be an effective counterbalance to the way J.D. Vance presents himself to the world, as shown in that clip of him making fun of Vance. I think both campaigns think a vice presidential debate will serve their interests. To me, it's just a question of when and where. Garrett Haig, live for us on the trail. Garrett, thank you very much. So listen, you heard some of the criticism from J.D. Vance there on Tim Walz's military record, attacks that appear to be two-pronged from the Republican team. First, accusations in their view that Walz gave up on his battalion when he left the military after 24 years. And second, that he alleged he served in a combat zone when he did not, with some Republicans pointing to this moment. I spent 25 years in the Army, and I hunt. And I gave the money back, and I'll tell you what I have been doing. I've been voting for common sense legislation that protects the Second Amendment, but we can do background checks. We can do CDC research. We can make sure we don't have reciprocal carry among states, and we can make sure that those weapons of war that I carried in war is the only place where those weapons are. At. So what's the reality here? Walls, remember, served from 1981 to 2005 in the National Guard. He retired according to the military and then, of course, in 2005 and then ran for Congress. Now, Walls has acknowledged in the past that he never saw combat, saying in 2018, I'm quoting here, I know that there are certainly folks that did far more than I did. I know that. But the Harris campaign putting out a statement today saying that the governor carried, fired, and trained others to use weapons of, more, of war innumerable times. Governor Walls would never insult or undermine any American service to this country. In fact, he thanks Senator Vance for putting his life on the line for our country. It's the American way. Our Pentagon correspondent, Courtney Kuby, is joining us now. So, Courtney, what is the reality check here? Yeah, so there's really two issues here, Hallie. The one you just mentioned and, uh, that we heard from Senator Vance about, and that is whether, in fact, Governor Walls, in his time in the National Guard, served in combat. The reality is he did do a deployment to Europe to support a combat operation in Afghanistan. While he didn't actually go to Afghanistan, he was there deployed in support of combat operations. I, I have to say, you know, if you talk to members of the military, they see this as just as critical. While you might not be dodging bullets on a daily basis, 
sending the logistics and supporting the units that are deployed forward is every bit as important during a combat operation as those people who are forward. So that's one. The second combat uh, deployment that has come into more light is when his his military guard, uh, a Minnesota National Guard unit, deployed to Iraq in 2006, several months after he retired as the most senior enlisted officer of that unit. That has kind of come under some criticism from people who were in that same battalion saying that, in fact, he, d he retired so he wouldn't have to deploy. The reality is, Hallie, his motivation for the timing of his retirement is really something that you have to ask Governor Walls about. Yeah, and of course, the Harris campaign saying that after 24 years of military service, the governor retired in 2005, going on to say that he was a tireless advocate for men and women in uniform, chaired Veterans Affairs, etc. As vice president, they say he will continue to be a relentless champion for our veterans and military families. Courtney QB, uh, for us there at the Pentagon Court, thank you very much. Appreciate it. I want to take it to Milwaukee now, where the widow of a man who died after being pinned down by hotel workers says charges against the men involved should not have taken as long as they did, as we are now hearing from those relatives, but saying that they're a step in the right direction. Listen. Do I feel like it's enough? No, but it's a start. I want them to be charged to the full extent of the law. They had no no remorse for him. They 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 didn't hold out. They they punished him. You're looking here at one of the four men now facing felony murder charges in connection to the death of Devontae Mitchell. This is Todd Erickson, who turned himself in today. Mitchell died in late June after employees grabbed him and held him face down on the ground outside the hotel. We're going to show you a video one time, once of those moments, but we have to warn you, the footage is very hard to watch. Police say somebody had gone into the hotel and, in their words, caused a disturbance. You can see here what looks like workers dragging him outside and holding him to the ground. According to the complaint, he was held down for something like eight to nine minutes. Antonio Hilton has been following this, and she's joining us now. We are hearing now from a bellhop who was involved in this incident, right, who says he showed no violence toward Mitchell. Mitchell's family is disputing that. Can you help us unpack that? That's right. So our affiliate on the ground, they spoke with Herbert Williamson. He is one of the four men who has now been charged with felony murder, who you see in the video there. And he w said that he was numb. It looked like he was processing this in real time uh, and wanted to uh, state his innocence. The family, though, has made very clear, uh, you know, our affiliate has spoken to the brother. Our team has spoken to the widow, who everyone just heard from right there. They made very clear that from the footage that they have seen and the different angles that have become available, that they feel that this was really an egregious response to this alleged disturbance. Um, you know, for I know you mentioned just only seeing that video one time, but it has been really hard for people there to process and see this repeatedly on the ground. Take a listen to the bellhop describing for himself. I became numb because I'm innocent. I didn't, I didn't do anything. All I did was what I was told to do by my management. And this is something we will likely hear more of because it's been a consistent question on the ground. The role of management here, what kind of directives did staff receive? Did they receive training saying that this kind of hold is what they're supposed to do in these incidents? Uh, it's not very typical to hear from someone who's been uh, charged with murder uh, speaking directly to the camera. So this is sort of an unusual level of access for us to get to someone in this position. But it's certainly going to be a big part of this case, Sally. Talk through what's happening as we look ahead to tomorrow now and a hearing scheduled there. What, what comes next? Well, these four men, they are going to have to uh, go to their hearings. They're turning themselves in, and they're going to have to respond to these charges. If what we just heard from the bellhop there is any indication, it looks like they are going to fight this. Um, and so this may drag out. There are going to be several parts of this investigation. Of course, um, a better uh, understanding of what transpired in the lobby. We don't see that on camera, for example. So what precedes all of what we see uh, in the video that's been released so far? Uh, but then also there's the question about the liability or responsibility of the hotel, the management, and other people who could have arguably had a connection to decisions made that day. Antonia Hilton, thank you very much for reporting all this out for us and keeping, uh, keeping on top of it. Appreciate it. I want to take you now to a pretty stunning development from NASA today. Do you remember those two astronauts who were supposed to head up to the space station for 10 days and then got held up for more than 60 days? Well, today, NASA is saying they may have to be up there for another six months. 
Remember, SUNY Williams and Butch Wilmore flew to the International Space Station on the Boeing Starliner spacecraft back in June. The mission was only supposed to be a week and a half, but the Starliner had some mechanical problems. So now NASA is weighing its options, and it may have to tap Boeing's rival, SpaceX, to help bring them home. It's also acknowledging that at some point, supplies are going to run short on what feels like the outer space reboot of Gilligan's Island. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has been all over this story for us. It's not a three-hour tour. It was a 10-day visit that has right. now turned into maybe, I mean, 63 days at least, and maybe six months. How does Six this, months more. This is what I'm saying. What do they do? I mean, do they have enough yeah. food? Do they have enough whatever that they so, need? So uh, it's still a, a possibility. But I got to say, listening to the conference call today with NASA, a long hour-and-a-half teleconference, they're clearly leaning in this direction. And the, and here's the, they got a whole bunch of problems and a whole bunch of caveats. But to your point, are they running out of supplies on the space station? Well, they now have two extra people on the space station using up the consumables. So yeah, they'd like to get them back. But take a look, here's the timeline for this mission. And here's how it got all messed up. Remember, they launched back on June 5th, supposed to be 10 day mission to the space station. June 9th, NASA said they're gonna delay Starliner's return. We need to work on some mechanical issues. June 14th, we're delaying again. June 21st, we're delaying again. June, July 25th, delaying again. And now today they say, the Starliner crew, not just Starliner, but the crew may be delayed until February of 2025. The problem is there is a big internal debate within NASA, mission managers and engineers, over whether it's safe for them to come back on Starliner. You've got a big division of opinion on this, and imagine you're the executive at NASA, NASA chief Bill Nelson, who needs to come down and make a decision, yes or no, do they come back on Starliner or not? If, if you've got a, a big chunk of your engineers arguing no, boy, that's an awfully hard nut to crack yeah. if you have to say, I'm going to overrule those engineers. I think they're leaning towards this. So if they come home and they need SpaceX to come home, yeah. is that a bad look for Boeing? What an embarrassment. Okay. What an embarrassment. I mean, Elon Musk has eaten Boeing's lunch. There's no other way to say it. Listen, Boeing has now, th this is their first crewed, in other words, people on board, crewed mission to the space station. And I think we can now say they're stuck. NASA doesn't like to say they're stuck because they do have an emergency escape vehicle just in case, but they're stuck. Uh, in the meantime, guess how many missions, crewed missions, SpaceX has flown to the space station? Nine, nine so far, wow. not to mention all the cargo missions. I mean, SpaceX has a track record of success. Boeing is stumbling. They are years behind schedule, something like a billion and a half dollars over budget. Okay, so when are we going to know for sure what's going to happen with I think, yeah, you're Or like, is this the for sure moment? No, I think we're very close to okay. it. They were telegraphing it today, but officially I think that they're going to make that announcement probably mid to late next week. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when you and I were sitting here at this very desk and you were talking through how, how Boeing and NASA were saying, hey, they're not stuck. We can yeah. get home anytime if we needed to. And then it felt like the worm started to turn yeah. a little bit. Well, I, listen, I started saying to people at NASA, give me a break. At a certain point, if you're stuck in the mall for months on end, okay, you could steal somebody's car to come home, but you're stuck because your car's broken. Aren't you kind of stuck? They take uh, issue with that, but at a certain point, come on, guys, they're kind of stuck. They're safe. They're safe. They're safe. That's fine. Yeah. But eight months? When you thought you were going for 10 days, Boy. I think they're stuck. Hope they got plenty of, plenty of uh, uh, clothes to, to last them through those things. I guess they're in space suits. But anyways, uh, Tom Costello, <laughs> thank you. Just crazy. It's crazy to think about. Crazy Appreciate with a capital C. Sure is. Later in the show, we got a lot more to get to, including the family of one of the victims of that Ocean Gate sub implosion now filing a massive new lawsuit. Our legal expert breaks it down. Plus, Nellie is in some hot water with the cops. That's in the five things. The family of a French explorer who died in that Titan submersible implosion last year is today filing a massive $50 million lawsuit against the sub's operator. Paul-Henri Narjolet was one of five people killed when the submersible imploded, remember, about two hours into that trip down to see the Titanic wreck site. The Titan was owned by OceanGate, a company that took tourists to visit the Titanic wreck and which suspended operations last July, less than three weeks after the implosion happened. A spokesperson is declining to comment on the suit. Our legal expert, Danny Savalos, is joining us now. 
This explorer was no Titanic wreck rookie. The suit says he was part of 37 dives to the Titanic, the most of any diver in the world. He was considered an expert. So walk us through the legalities here, because didn't OceanGate require customers to sign something that specifically mentioned the possibility of death? Reportedly, yes, but waivers are an obstacle. They're not always an insurmountable obstacle. There are ways of getting around them. For example, if some of the hazards uh, that actually caused the harm weren't really disclosed. Like, for example, I doubt that waiver says anything about, hey, if there's some structural problem with this uh, submersible, that's not on you. That's not on us. That's your thing to worry about. That's the kind of thing that you might be able to, if true, show that the waiver is no good. So if the potential damages are significant enough, plaintiff's attorneys, including me, will sometimes proceed even when you have a waiver that seems to apparently absolve the company, the defendant, of all, all responsibility. Why did it take so long to file the suit? Is that typical in an instance like this, more than a year after this implosion happened? It is typical. Washington state okay. has a three year personal injury statute of limitations. And then similarly, the Jones Act, which is the uh, Maritime Act that this is also filed under, also has a three year statute of limitations. So they were nowhere close to running out of time. And you often wait. I often wait uh, up to a year just to sort of do your investigation and figure out where your damages are, get your ducks lined up and file the best complaint that you can, especially in a case like this where you have a waiver to deal with. You really want to do a little investigation to make sure you have enough facts to get over or beyond that waiver if, in fact, there is one that applies to this claim. So then how would you, if you had to handicap the chances of this lawsuit moving forward, how would you? I'd put them at high. I mean, okay. if they filed it, then they feel confident they can get past the waiver. The defense will probably move to throw the case out based on the waiver and based on maybe some other things. But uh, ultimately, if it survives that motion, then in all likelihood, most civil cases don't go to trial. They usually end up settling. Uh, that's just playing the odds. That's where a lot of cases like this usually end up. Danny Savalos, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, take a look at this new pretty dramatic time-lapse video of that huge park fire in California. Look at that. That super thick smoke just taken over the sky. That park fire has burned more than 420,000 acres so far, destroying some 600 buildings. It's about 34% contained. Number two, Nelly, the rapper, has been arrested in St. Louis today for failure to appear on a traffic charge from a few years back. According to arrest records, he was also in possession of multiple ecstasy pills. Police say he's been released from their custody. We're out to Nelly's team for comment. We haven't heard back yet, but we'll let you know when we do. Number three, crews rescuing somebody who fell nearly 30 feet while rock climbing in the mountains in Albuquerque. She was badly hurt. It took crews about 40 minutes to reach her. Uh, there was a helicopter that pulled her up. She was flown to the hospital, but no word on how she's doing now. Number four, a boil water advisory has been issued for the entire East Bank of New Orleans after a balloon hit a power line. That's what did it. This advisory is going to be in effect until at least Thursday while officials test the water samples. Number five, Dolce & Gabbana is launching a new perfume. Uh, it's $100. It's called Fifi, and it's not so much for you as for your best friend. That's right. You can now buy perfume for your dog uh, if you've been desperately seeking that. Some vets are not too happy with it. They say it may interfere with dogs' sense of smell or cover up certain odors that could be a symptom of disease. Fifi, the perfume. New research out today finds some tobacco companies are using chemicals that mimic nicotine and potentially getting around health regulations. Companies that are essentially replacing nicotine with largely untested chemicals, according to Duke scientists. They basically do the same thing. They're trying to allegedly dodge some of these nicotine rules. These products also have flavors and sweeteners, things that experts say could attract younger people or non-vapers into sort of the vaping arena. Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now for more on this. What are these, what do we know about these chemicals, how much of them are in these products, and should we be, you know, super concerned about it or what? Yeah, so these uh, these researchers, Hallie, they looked at two uh, different major brands of these e-cigarettes, and they were really concentrating on two different chemicals that were in there. One of them is called 6-methyl nicotine, and the other one is, is called nicotinamide. And what these are, as you mentioned, are kind of like nicotine analogs, meaning they're very, they're kind of chemically similar, but they're different enough insofar as they haven't been studied and they are not FDA regulated. And what they found was specifically for the 6-methyl 
menthol nicotine, that is considerably more toxic and more potent than regular, regular nicotine. They actually found in one particular product that there was less than that was on the product uh, label. But what they also found, Hallie, which is concerning, is that, as you said, they may contain sweeteners, they might contain coolants, and experts don't know the mix of that, especially when these e-cigarettes are heated up, how much potential damage that could cause to the user. So if you're trying to stop uh, to, to you know, stop smoking by vaping, essentially, which is something that's not super uncommon, what should you be looking for? And I want to highlight one thing, is that the research does show that the use of e-cigarettes, regular use of e-cigarettes, does result in smoking cessation of what we call regular cigarettes or combustible cigarettes. But I want to be very, very clear about this. The FDA very firmly states that there is no such thing as a safe tobacco product, and e-cigarettes are considered tobacco products because nicotine derives from tobacco. So look, I mean, if you are a smoker and you want to quit smoking and you're using an e-cigarette, by all means, but you need to educate yourself about proper use of the battery, proper use of the liquid, um, and to be aware that there are significant harms that can come from e-cigarettes, including significant lung injury. You need to educate yourself if you're going to use this for smoking cessation period. Okay, Dr. Natalie Azar, uh, good words of wisdom. Appreciate that. Coming up, some pretty wild scenes from London tonight. We're watching counter protesters come out in force. We'll take you live to London. Plus, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia breaking a 400-year-old record and not the good kind. We'll explain. Thousands of counter-protesters are in the UK tonight, even as we speak, gathering against anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant violence that has been bubbling up in the country for a week after the knife attack that left three girls dead. I want to show you some aerial pictures now from London. This is a shot that we're getting in here with huge, huge crowds in the street. They're chanting things like refugees welcome and London against racism. They're gathering in some of those same cities where police have been deployed in anticipation of more violent far-right protests those riots fueled by disinformation that spread quickly online in the wake of that horrific attack last week, where the suspect was wrongly identified as an asylum seeker who had just arrived in the UK. Josh Letterman is joining us now. So night after night, and you've been on it from the jump, and we've covered it now for just about a week. We've seen those initial protests happen, those initial riots, essentially. Now these counter-protesters are turning out in big numbers. I know you had a chance to get out there. You were in it. What was the sense that you got from people there? Yeah, the good news is, Hallie, that tonight was far less violent than police had feared. I was at two of those protests tonight where the anti-immigration rioters, frankly, did not show up. It was only uh, anti-protesters who were there to show solidarity with immigrants and refugees. And in fact, uh, just in the last five minutes or so, we got an update from London police who said there were two really large protests tonight that they largely went off safely and without any incident in Northampton. They they actually, the police encouraged people to go home because the anti-immigration protesters that they were there to kind of counter hadn't bothered to show up. I want you to hear from one of these counter protesters who showed up to show support to show support for immigrants uh, and have to hear what she had to say. Listen. There's no logic behind it. There's no critical thinking behind it. These people don't know why they're angry. They put one and one together. They got five. They're angry at the state of the country, but they don't know why. So get educated. Police say there were only about 10 arrests tonight. They were all in Croydon, which is about 10 miles south of where I'm at in central London. They say all of those were people who actually were not associated with any kind of ideological protest. They were essentially just troublemakers who showed up. And so uh, that is giving some hope that perhaps some of this is quieting down, Hallie. There's also, I mean, the disinformation factor has been a big one here. And that is, again, something we've been covering. There's an Elon yeah. Musk component to this, an Elon Musk twist almost. Explain that. Yeah, well, Elon Musk has been fanning the flames by essentially accusing the British government of having a double standard towards far-right protesters, saying that the U.K. shouldn't just be focused on making Muslims feel welcome, but should be make, focused on making everybody, including people on the right, feel welcome. That is obviously not uh, comments that the U.K. government uh, feels is helpful right now, and particularly after disinformation played a role uh, in fanning the flames after the stabbing last week, the U.K. now says it is going after those social media companies that allow this kind of stuff on their platforms, Allie. 
Josh Letterman live for us in London tonight. Josh, thanks for bringing us up to speed. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Germany, at least two people are dead after a hotel collapsed there, leaving several others also trapped. We don't know how many people have been rescued yet, but fire officials say the rescue operation was difficult because the upper floor caved in, so two ceilings were like pancaked on top of each other. Officials say they also evacuated some 30 people from the area around the hotel. Out of Australia, a new record and one that they didn't want to break. Ocean temperatures in the Great Barrier Reef, the hottest they've been in 400 years, according to scientists. The reef has been through some bad coral bleaching over the last decade. And now scientists are finding that water temps hit their highest at the beginning of this year, much higher than temperatures dating all the way back to the early 1600s. And out of Indonesia, a new study finds fossils discovered on an island there belong to an early human species nicknamed hobbits who are just over three feet tall. The fossils were first found a couple decades ago, but this new study found they actually had ancestors who were even shorter than researchers first thought. The study also revealing they existed some 700,000 years ago. Still to come, an all around huge day for Team USA at the Olympics including our resident gold medalist, Keir Simmons. He is gonna be joining us live from Paris for a big night for him, teeing up his favorite moment. Get ready. Let's do it, lock in. Here he comes, next. <laughs> the United States bringing home some more medals at the Olympics today uh, in athletics, uh, Quickie, excuse me, Quincy Hall bringing home gold for Team USA in the men's 400 meter. This was a wild race. And then in the women's pole vault, you had American Katie Moon taking home the silver with a vault of just under 16 feet, 4.85 meters. And then there's this artistic swimming routine that helped Team USA win a silver medal. That's the first medal that the artistic swimmers have won in like 20 years. Big day for Team USA, a big day for our dear friend, Keir Simmons, who's live for us tonight in Paris to break it all down for us, Keir. Let's I just get into it, my it. friend. I just finished watching the artistic swimming. Drama. Wow. I mean, it was, it's drama, it's wow. beautiful, and it's a big deal, first time in a couple decades that the U.S. has won. And i tell you something as well. I, 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 do you watch artistic swimming much? I don't know. It's got... Maybe do I missed you? something. I, I, I feel like the last time I was, like, 10 years old that I watched yours, I don't know. But, like, it's gone full gangster. I mean, it's like... <laughs> Uh, the, the, the faces, the contortions, and the music, it's, it's like Japan did uh, Eminem for the whole routine. Canada did a medley of Eminem and, and, and Dre and Snoop. Um, the, the, I tell you, sometimes, though, it, it makes me anxious. Um, they come up out of the water, and some of the women are so, women so red-faced. I'm thinking this is, a, this is a dangerous sport. Maybe it is a dangerous I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so intense. It's really, it's so really, athletic. really yeah. impressive. So intense. And then, as you said, uh, Team USA, just, just in the past few minutes, almost got gold. They were, they were penultimate. They were second to last to perform. They were in first place. And then, how about this for geopolitics? Then China comes in, incredible routine, and they push uh, Team USA into second place. They have also, they have the things on the noses, which is, uh, you know, they just have these contraptions on their noses that, that um, I, I think you probably have to do that when you're under the water so much and diving in and out and things. But yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing sport. It's incredible, um, also incredible, yeah, was, Noah Lyles. That was my Everybody analysis. Said, Did you like that? was my expert analysis right there. I thought you were just yapping, Kier. I thought you were just riffing, it, you know what I mean? It. Just like chit-chatting <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> can we talk about, wait, can we talk about Noah Lyles? Because that's drama too. Yeah. He, he's so amazing. He's right. now going to be already, you know, a, a crusher. He's now going to go to the 200 meter um, yeah. final tomorrow, right? Like that, and that's a significant yeah. thing too. Yeah, and if he manages to do that, that's the first time, as we mentioned last time we spoke, since 1984 and Carl and Lewis for, for Team uh, USA. Of course, you had Usain Bolt uh, pulling that off a number of times in previous uh, Olympics. Uh, but, yeah, now Noah Lyles, I mean, he's on the edge of glory, isn't he? he, he he's, and he's so, you know, he's such a performer. I've said it before, on the track and then off the track. So, I mean, I can't wait for that race. Um, it's, it's a big one, uh, and it's a big one not least because he is just, he's that kind of sprinter that really um, you know makes you want to watch um, and and just kind of want to you want to see what he does and how he how he uh, reacts when he when he when he manages it we'll just see it's so tight it's so there are there are you know fractions of a second in this thing
Um, okay, we have to get to, uh, of course, our favorite part of the day, which is the Kier yeah. favorite moment. What, it, what was it yeah. today for you? What was your number one moment? What did you like the well, best? I, well, I, I prepared, but it was going to be artistic swimming, and then you, and when we, 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 we kicked <laughs> off with artistic swimming. So now I'm lost you again. You were quite prepared. You were really well prepared I, on the artistic <laughs> swimming, yeah. I was, I was, because that was going to be my... Anyway, listen, didn't happen today, but I love that Team USA beat Germany in the soccer. And why? Okay. Because I'm English, and in the end, <laughs> anyone who beats Germany in soccer is all right with me. It, it, it's, it's pretty good. And I'm willing to swallow the fact that, you know, you guys win at everything, and do you have to win at soccer as well? Uh, you know, and also <laughs> that the fact that you guys start doing well in soccer again, which of course hasn't happened since back in 2012, you know, robs me of the ability to say, you know, condescendingly say to, you know, my US friends, you know that game soccer where you kick a ball around and there's like, a, you know, a net and, 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 and by the way, uh, there's no commercial, there's only one commercial break how about that? That, that you know i don't get to do all that when you guys are winning so hey, but it's still my favorite favorite thing Kira, i think the olympics is the only time where you're allowed to get away with calling your colleagues you guys here uh, across the pond here in the u.s uh, th <laughs> thanks i guess uh we're looking forward to that match of course i think it's on saturday right the gold the gold medal match for the women's soccer right okay right. Kira exactly simmons right. yeah. I, too bad right. we don't have a show on saturday maybe we can just like get together yeah. facetime a little watch it and riff in yeah that, let's do it let's do it unplugged thank you Kira simmons appreciate you friend live for us tonight in paris still to come some new research suggesting just how the great pyramids were actually built in egypt and here's a hint wasn't aliens some new research now puts out a novel theory on how the great pyramids in egypt were actually built a mystery that has baffled people for literally hundreds of years. Archaeologists now say the ancient Egyptians may have harnessed the power of water to float these huge stone blocks hundreds of feet in the air. That's what this new research says, but not everybody is convinced. NBC's David Noriega has more. The age-old question, how did the Egyptians build the pyramids? Perplexing historians all the way back to ancient Greece, stumping Napoleon's archaeologists, and becoming the butt of jokes today. Did this start at the top and work down, or start at the bottom and work up? Although we're fairly sure they started at the bottom, we still don't know exactly how they did it. There are all kinds of theories. Ramps, cranes, and, yes, aliens. Probably extraterrestrials. Now we're getting a new potential answer, one a little more grounded in reality. Water. Researchers just published a study suggesting that hydraulic force could have helped build the step pyramid for Pharaoh Djoser more than 4,600 years ago. It's the oldest of the seven monumental pyramids in Egypt and was at the time the largest structure, coming in at 204 feet. That's King, or Pharaoh, LeBron James, stacked head to toe more than 30 times. Some of those stones weighing more than 600 pounds. The researchers now say the internal architecture of the pyramid supports a new theory, a hydraulic lift. A nearby structure might have functioned as a dam. Water could have flowed into shafts inside the pyramid that would have raised some sort of float carrying the stones, like a water elevator. They say the discovery represents a significant leap in our comprehension of ancient Egyptian engineering. The question is, where would the water have come from? Researchers say the area used to be more of a savanna than a desert, getting a lot more rain than it does now. But some experts are skeptical. I think it's extremely unlikely, to say the least. John Darnell is a professor of Egyptology at Yale. We don't have any evidence for the Egyptians making use of, let's say, water pressure or understanding or exploiting that. It would be very difficult to do that using the structures they're describing because the enclosure would leach water into the desert. The researchers behind the new study say there's more to investigate. They're looking into whether other pyramids could have been built in a similar way, from the inside out. So in many ways, it all remains a mystery. And alien watchers can keep their eyes on the skies. David Noriega, NBC News. The more you know, that does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.